I think what Eugene O'Neill said is true. Man is broken. He lives by mending, and the grace of God is the glue. And uh, I think for all of us, we believe that it is the grace of God that is the glue that holds us together. A little bit about me. Um, I became a believer under the teaching ministry of Dr. Ray Stedman, who was a soft lordship salvationist. I then had the privilege of meeting Dr. John MacArthur and uh, decided to go to seminary. And when I got to seminary, I was a lordship salvationist because everything I knew came from Dr. MacArthur. As I studied at Dallas Seminary uh, with Dr. Ryrie and a few others, I realized that, that probably wasn't correct. And so it came time to write my thesis for my THM degree. And I decided to write about a friend of mine called uh, on the topic of lordship salvation as taught by John MacArthur. <clears throat> and I had the opportunity to meet with Dr. MacArthur numerous times and talk with him about his views, because my views had begun to change. And so I remember the last time we got together, we were having breakfast in Dallas, and he had read the thesis, and he uh, agreed of what I had said about him. And of course, this is before he wrote any of his books, because it was a long time ago. And we got done with breakfast, and he said, you know, Fred, I think this is such an important topic that I need to write a book about this. And so he then wrote the book, The Gospel According to Jesus. And that kind of opened up the floodgates for a whole lot of interesting discussion. And then after that, I ended up at Phoenix Seminary, where I taught for over 20 years. And all of a sudden, uh, it used to be a free grace seminary. And then Dr. Wayne Grudem was invited to come and teach. And Dr. Grudem began to import some of the reformed theological perspectives. And so Wayne and I had become friends. We had dialogued quite a bit over many, many issues, many, many discussions, and um, realized that we didn't agree on certain things. And so uh, one of the things I did was write a book, next slide, about faith. And I was trying to understand some of those topics and so I wrote this book, The Faith That Saves. Now, the book is a little bit old now, and so I'm actually in the process of rewriting it because many, many new studies have come out on the topic of faith, and so I want to try to be a little more updated. So I'll be doing that this year, Lord willing. At any rate, uh, after um, being at Phoenix Seminary for many, many years, I went over to Grace School of Theology, and Dr. Grudem uh, had written many things about his views against free grace theology. And so I decided it was time that we put together a book on free grace theology. So we wrote a book called The Defense for Free Grace Theology, which is in direct response to Dr. Grudem's book that talked about why free grace theology is wrong. And so uh, it, it's been an interesting book. Both of them have been well read and people have had some very nice comments about it. Uh, but the issue is still going on, so we need to talk about that uh, tonight. Next slide. So <clears throat> I want to talk about a very essential theological distinction. Obviously, that distinction has to do with the gospel itself. Next slide. We all know that the Great Commission is the uh, center point for us. We have the Great Comment, all authority has been given to me, and then the Great Commission where we have one verb, make disciples, and then three participles that guide us through that. As we're going, we are evangelizing the lost, and we are edifying the saved. As we do that, we are participating in what we call the Great Commission. Next slide. So we need to keep in mind that this Great Commission is not just evangelism, but it's the main verb of disciple-making how to make followers of Jesus. Next slide. The way we do that, obviously, is by a combination, next slide, of keeping the distinction between salvation and discipleship, or the relationship and fellowship. One is a one-time act. The other is a life going ongoing act. So we need to keep those two distinct, and I'm assuming since our audience is theologically trained, you all know that. Next slide. So we want to talk about a theology, but the theology has got to be built from the 
exegetical evidence. So when we talk about faith, next slide, obviously we're talking about the Gospel of John. We're looking at things that talk about belief, belief in his name. That's how the gospel begins. That's how the gospel ends. Next slide. John is quite clear about doing that. And so he gives us quite a few places to mark off this all important topic. Next slide. If you were simply doing a count, you would see that pistis or pistuo is used over a hundred times in the book. Believing in his name seems to be a very important um, phraseology in John. Next slide. Because when you believe in his name, you have eternal life, and you have what we would call salvation. Next slide. You find a variety of forms of this in the Gospel of John, but it's he who believes gains the water of eternal life or the food for eternal life. Next slide. But we also remember that there are what we might call degrees of faith. You can have a little faith, you can have great faith, small faith, mustard seed faith, and there's also some dangers with faith because some people's faith becomes shipwrecked or becomes weak or becomes upset or even as James chapter 2 says, dead faith. Next slide. We also need to remember that just because a person's a Christian doesn't mean they will always be courageous in fact, sometimes they will be cowardly. Joseph of Arimathea was a secret disciple of Jesus in John 19. And so he was a coward for a while, but finally he came out with Nicodemus and they asked for the body. And of course, Peter seemed to have a hard time mentioning Jesus every once in a while. And he was a coward as well, but fortunately he had, he had the ability to make a comeback and proclaim the name of Christ around the world. Next slide. So when we talk about faith, we've discovered these days that we have three categories of how this term is used. Category one would be from a free grace perspective. We talk about mental assent. That's not a negative way of saying it. That's simply saying I mentally understand and accept something. Some people use the word persuasion. I am, I am not persuaded. And then I hear this, and now I am persuaded. And so faith is simply becoming persuaded of something. Uh, others would use the word convinced. Others would tighten that up to have a conviction. Others would just call it belief. Category two, from our Reformed brothers, you have belief and trust. Dr. Grudem likes the word trust more. But then, then that brings in the idea of confidence some would then move to obedience, and then the traditional trifold idea of nutitia, knowledge, assensus, assenting, and then fiducia or fiducia, the, the volitional action orientation. So that has been the classic reform view for many, many years. But today we now have a third view that is held by the neo-Roman Catholic Matthew Bates. Uh, Dr. Bates went to Notre Dame, did his PhD there. He teaches in a small Protestant, I believe, excuse me, Catholic college, although he claims to be more of a Protestant. Well, Dr. Bates has added to the idea of faith being believe or faith being persuaded or faith being trust, but no, no, it needs to be commitment the kind of commitment that surrenders all, that results in obedience. But then he has attached the idea of allegiance. We must have total allegiance to Jesus. This is a very strong concept. So when you're talking about faith, some people like to front load and so that refers to the type of faith. They say, well, real faith as opposed to fake faith. Others try to backload. Well, it's simply faith, but if the faith doesn't result in something in the end works, then it really wasn't faith. So commitment is contained as a condition. 
So many people front load, some people back load, but at the end of the day, it gets changed. Go back a slide, Erwin. Gordon Clark wrote a book many, many years ago. Uh, he was a Christian, a reformed theologian, and he wrote his book, Faith and Saving Faith. And he dispelled the idea that fiducia was part of faith. He said, faith is just simple. It's just faith. Well, he's a reform guy, but the reform guys didn't accept what he had to say. Next slide. So what we end up with here is how are we justified? Or as Job said, how can an unrighteous man be made righteous in the sight of a righteous God? That's the cry of the New Testament as well. And so some people say, well, you're saved by faith and works. And others say you're saved by faith that works. And some would say you're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. Next slide. So this has been a long theological argument. The Roman Catholic Church, you're saved by faith and works, specifically utilizing James 2 to blend justification and sanctification. The Reformation saying you're saved by faith, that works, using James 2 as well to validate that. So we end up with the Reformed, uh, excuse me, the Roman Catholic Church and the Council of Trent. We end up with the Reformed Westminster Confession. We end up with these two options. And of course, the question is, is there a, a third option? And we would say yes, but it's got to be based on exegetical theology that would lead to biblical theology and then finally to our systematic theology. Next slide. So our Reformed brothers would say, nope, you're saved by faith alone. But as either Luther, Calvin, or Melanchthon said, nobody can get the quote direct, but the faith that saves is never alone. Next slide. So again, along came <clears throat> Dr. Clark to clarify that, but the Reformed brothers don't accept what their Reformed brother wrote. They want to go more towards what we would call traditionally a lordship salvation. Next slide. So in lordship, salvation, and assurance, you basically have a major premise. We're justified by faith. The minor premise, faith inevitably produces good works. Conclusion, we can be judged according to our good works. This is the classic Reformed view of justification by faith that includes assurance. Next slide. So Dr. Kenneth Gentry, who helped start this argument many, many, many years ago, says faith means believing. It is the act of understanding and accepting is true a statement or proposition. The Lordship view expressly states the necessity of acknowledging Christ as Savior and Lord and Master of one's life in an act of receiving him as Savior. These are not two different sequential acts, but rather one act of pure trusting obedience. So saving faith requires trust and a pure act of trusting. Next slide. Dr. MacArthur would take that a little further. Believing in Christ is to believe God is the loving Father and that Jesus Christ is God and all that he says is true and having, a, having an unswerving, unchanging, unquestioning obedience to that belief. That's saving faith. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I've had an unswerving, unchanging faith. That's a high bar to meet every day of my life. Next slide. Next slide. Dr. Piper adds it this way. There's no doubt that Jesus saw. Go back. Thank you. There's no doubt that Jesus saw a measure of real lived out obedience to the will of God as necessary for final salvation. What God will require at the judgment is not a perfection, but sufficient fruit to show that the tree had life. In our case, divine life. Necessary 
obedience lived out. Or, as Dr. Sproul says, endurance in faith is a condition for future salvation. Only those who endure in faith will be saved for eternity. So that's both a front load and a back load combination. You have to have the right kind of faith, and it's got to be enduring faith. And if you don't, you don't. So the question becomes, well, how much evidence? Next slide. So David Platt says, the Bible nowhere teaches that caring for the poor is a means by which we earn salvation. The means of our salvation is faith in Christ alone, the basis of salvation, the work of Christ alone. Yet, while caring for the poor is not the basis, this does not mean that our use of wealth is totally disconnected from our salvation. Indeed, caring for the poor, among other things, is evidence of our salvation. Next slide. Next slide. Caring for the poor is one natural outflow of and a necessary evidence, a necessary evidence of the presence of Christ in our hearts. So if you don't care for the poor, you're not saved. Next slide. Dr. Piper would put it this way. These are just some of the conditions that the New Testament says we must meet in order to inherit final salvation. We must believe on Jesus and receive him and turn from our sin and obey him and humble like ourselves like little children and love him more than we love our family, our possessions, our own life. This is what it means to be converted to Christ. This alone is the way of everlasting life or life everlasting. <clears throat> now, that's a pretty high bar. If that's what it means to be converted, if that's what you must do, if that's the condition of becoming a believer. Next slide. Dr. MacArthur would add this aspect to it. It's pretty simple. Anyone who wants to come after Jesus into the kingdom of God, anyone who wants to be a Christian has to face three commands, deny himself, take up his cross daily, follow him. So if that's how you become a Christian, what's it mean you take up your cross daily? Well, that means you endure to the end. You persevere to the end. That means you must work until the end, and you'll never know till you get to the end. This is all predicated upon what genuine faith is. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Dr. MacArthur puts it this way. James 4, 7 is the clearest presentation of the gospel. Here's the gospel. Here's the clearest presentation. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's the gospel? Believing in Christ is this. Believe God as a loving Father and that Jesus Christ is God and all that he says is true and have an unswerving, unchanging, unquestioning obedience to that belief, that's saving faith. Next slide. <clears throat> Dr. MacArthur would say, how are we saved? We must accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's the beginning, but then we must come to him as Lord and commit our entire life to him, and there must be the manifestation of the fruit of repentance. Next slide. So you can see there's a fairly significant volitional element in faith. The lordship view would take the word or the root of the word, pith, from which we end up with another word, patho, which means obey, to bind, to trust. And hence they would move from that to pistuo, which means to trust and obey. So you have to have knowledge, and then you have to have understanding, which actually is the same thing as knowledge. And then you have to have volition. You must believe and act on that belief. Of course, the non-lordship people would agree that you have to have knowledge and, and accept, assent or accept that as true. But as term, in terms of having to live it out and how much you have to live it out, 
that becomes a problem. Next slide. The Lordship folks would ask us to consider prepositions. So when you believe in, that's effective saving faith. When you believe that, that's not saving faith, some of our Lordship friends would say. However, believing that with a haughty clause is saving faith in the Gospel of John. And sometimes you don't even have a preposition. So some of the grammatical and syntactical dancing in this is somewhat problematic. However, today we have Dr. Bates, next slide, who has written his book, and he has taken this idea of faith to an all new level. Allegiance alone. You're saved by allegiance alone. Dr. Bates would say, Pistis, faith has a broad range. He says, this range includes the idea, ideas that aren't usually associated in our contemporary culture with belief or faith, such as reliability, confidence, assurance, fidelity, faithfulness, commitment, and pledged loyalty. Next slide. Pledged loyalty. With regard to eternal salvation, rather than speaking of belief or trust or faith in Jesus, we should speak instead of fidelity to Jesus as cosmic Lord or allegiance to Jesus the King. Allegiance is the best macro term available to us that can describe what God requires from us for eternal salvation. So in order to become a Christian, you have to have this fidelity. You have to have allegiance to the Jesus the King. And if you're not faithful, if you're not having total allegiance, you're not saved. You don't have eternal salvation. Next slide. Dr. Bates then wrote another book. That's what you do when you write one book that works, you write another one. So he wrote Gospel Allegiance. And here he goes even farther. Next slide. Next slide, yeah. Uh, there are extensive misunderstandings of the gospel today. I think it's happening because present salvation models, now get this, present salvation models such as Lordship Salvation, Free Grace, Tulip, and the Catholic model are inadequate. Lordship Salvation is not even far enough. These misunderstandings are present in standard resources written by pastors such as Matt Chandler, Greg Gilbert, John MacArthur, John Piper, and R.C. Sproul. They are among the best teachers that the church has, but they're not enough. Next slide. Because the climax of the biblical gospel is not the cross, but frequently something frequently not considered part of the gospel at all, the enthronement of Jesus. And when we see this, we might begin to see why saving faith in the Bible intends not just belief or interior trust in God's promise, but bodily allegiance to a king. So it's not mental. It's not heart. It's bodily allegiance to the king. Seeing this compels us to rethink how faith, grace, and works fit together. Next slide. <clears throat> Dr. Bates says, in relationship to the Good Samaritan, all of which reinforces the basic point that is necessary to perform the concrete acts of service to those who are in need in order to gain eternal life. You've got to help and be a good Samaritan in order to gain eternal life. Next slide. In response to the gospel, we are saved by allegiance alone. Allegiance alone. Next slide. So this is where the model has moved to. 
It's moved to category three. It's moved to a view of faith that is far beyond John MacArthur. Bates says that this pistis was not described as a one-time decision. Rather, its duration is consistently stressed. Allegiance that was genuinely endured over the course of a full campaign or military career. So faith is allegiance to God through one's life. And if you falter, you, are, you were never saved in the first place. Next slide. So we need to be mindful of people like Dr. Bates. Now, Dr. Bates did not start this. Next slide. Dr. Daniel Fuller, in his book many, many years ago, 1990, The Unity of the Bible. So if you're interested in, history, uh, in the historical search of where these things came from, you want to read Dr. Fuller because he helps us understand that faith is commitment. Faith is surrender. Faith is a living faith that Abraham had all his life. Now, fast forward to 2023. Next slide. <clears throat> Dr. Piper, who gives credit to Dr. Fuller for teaching him all these things, has come out with a book called What is Saving Faith? Now, Dr. Piper was at the Evangelical Theological Society this past November, and I had an opportunity to meet him. And he gave everybody there a book. This was the book, a hardback. This is like a $20 book. He gave everybody there a book. He gave 3,000 books away. And then I went and listened to his two-hour seminar on the book. So I'd already read the book because I got it before. Then he gave his talk. And in this book, Dr. Piper says, unless Jesus is the most precious thing in your life, you will go to hell. If you really believe, that makes that means you make Jesus the most precious thing in your life. So faith is making Jesus the most precious thing in your life. Now, next slide. Other books have come out before this that articulate this. Covenant and Commandment, Dr. Green who I actually talked on the phone about his book to use it and make sure I understood what he was saying. But he was he was saying very simply, works and obedience have to be involved in your life. Otherwise, the faith is not true. Next slide. One of the earlier practitioners of, practitioners of this was Dr. Paul Rainbow. Now, I, Dr. Rainbow came to ETS one year, and he came to my... Uh, a session that I gave on faith. And then I went to his session that he gave on faith. And then he and I had dinner one night. And I said, you know, Paul, you sound like a neo-Catholic. And he said, really? I said, absolutely. So we had a very delightful discussion over our chicken dinner at the banquet about faith. But Dr. Rainbow's view is no different than Dr. Piper's view in 2023. It's the same idea of this faith that must be treating Jesus as the most important thing in your life, or Dr. Bates's idea of having allegiance. So these ideas have been cooking about the, the role of obedience in saving faith. Next slide. Dr. Rainbow redid his book, putting a new cover on it, which was kind of interesting, but it's the same book. It's the same stuff. Next slide. Along comes Dr. Alan Stanley, no relation to Charles Stanley, but Dr. Stanley did his PhD dissertation at Dallas Seminary, and this is what it is. Did Jesus teach salvation by works? The answer is yes. In the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus taught you're saved by works. How this got through the, the dissertation committee at Dallas Seminary is unclear because one of the men on the committee didn't agree with the book, and yet somehow the, the dissertation got through. Dr. Stanley uh, then took this book and refashioned it for a little more modern instead of a monograph. Next slide. We have a book that's a little more hip. Salvation is more complicated than you think. Well, it's very complicated when you have to work out your salvation. Next slide. Last year also at ETS, I met with Kevin McFadden, who spoke on faith. And uh, then he wrote his book on faith, Faith in the Son of God. And he takes a very strident view of what pistis means, not quite as far as Dr. Bates.
Next slide. There's a couple of books that have recently come out by Teresa Morgan, and she's at Oxford, and this book was published by Oxford, The New Testament and the Theology of Trust. Now, that's the giveaway, trust. She goes back to say, in the ancient Roman world, trust was the key factor. And so she wrote a follow-up book, Roman Faith and Christian Faith, and the two handshakes. That's the trust. That's the bond of trust. So she actually kind of comes back a little bit from some of the more strident views on this uh, concept. Next slide. However, most of us remember the books by Dr. MacArthur, Faith Works. The title kind of gives it away, doesn't it? Next slide. His book that came out also, Hard to Believe. And he would say it's hard to believe because you have to commit, surrender, yield everything in your life and have an unswerving, unaltering, unchanging commitment. That's saving faith. Well, that's hard to believe indeed. Salvation by Grace, Matthew Barrett, a traditional lordship man, uh, very strident on the idea of effectual calling and the idea that your faith must be active from day one. Next slide. John Barclay has written a couple of books. One of them is short. One of them is long. Uh, they're both similar, Paul and the Gift. And he talks about the reciprocity element in the concept of faith, that if God gives you this, you have to give him that. He does not use the word allegiance, but trust and commitment seem to find their way into this reciprocity syndrome. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Gupta has written a very interesting book about Paul and the language of faith. And uh, the foreword by James Dunn, more of a uh, kind of a liberal evangelical from um, the UK. But uh, Gupta has become fairly well known in a lot of his work on Thessalonians and the New Testament and uh, now on Paul and the language of faith. Of course, what has now become a classic even though it's not old enough to be a classic, but it's become a classic in the Reformed tradition. Next slide, the, the Free Grace Theology book by Dr. Grudem, Five Ways It Diminishes the Gospel. And so Dr. Grudem says that if you believe in free grace, you're actually diminishing the gospel. The irony is, I asked Dr. Grudem, I said, you know, I said, Wayne, if I preach the free grace gospel message to somebody and they believe it, are they saved? And he said, yes. And I said, then what's our problem? If they hear the gospel I preach and they believe it, they're saved, then what's, what do you want to add? Why would you want to add anything? He said, well, I'm afraid that you're giving assurance to people who don't really believe. And I said, but if they believe in what I preached and you said what I preached would help them be saved, then that's not a problem. And then I said, besides that, with your doctrine of election, no one's going to sneak into heaven who shouldn't be there, and no one's going to sneak out of hell who shouldn't be there because God's preordained it, elected them before the foundation of the world. They can't choose to get out or in. So there's no problem of people having bad assurance. He didn't think that was very helpful. Well, his book, I think, is somewhat problematic. But I do appreciate, at least at the beginning of the book, he seems to indicate free grace theology can help guide a person and grant them eternal life if they believe that gospel. So I'm not sure why we're having such an argument over this all the time. So at any rate, faith is under attack. We've got three categories of how the word is looked at. We need to begin to understand, going back to the, the Bible, back in the history and looking how this word is used and making sure our theology doesn't get too confused. Now, theology has got to be built from exegetical evidence, and so we need to talk a bit about assurance because many people put that as the back end of the idea of faith. Next slide. I, Howard Marshall, a committed Arminian who passed away recently, he, he said, Arminians know they are saved, but are afraid they can't keep it. Calvinists know they can't lose their salvation, but are afraid they don't have it. Well, that's kind of a nice way of putting it. Fortunately, we're not in either of those categories. 
Next slide. The assassination of assurance. When the glorious gospel of grace is either front-loaded or back-loaded, the result is the loss of assurance based on the objective, finished work of Christ. It is then based on the subjective, continual work of man. And that becomes a problem. Next slide. So ask yourself the question, who said this? Endurance in faith is a condition for future salvation. Only those who endure in faith will be saved for eternity. That could be one of a number of people. The scriptures repeatedly exhort us to preserve, to hang in there. It's only the one who endures to the end who will be saved. There's no cleansing from sin and no salvation without a continual walking in God's light. No salvation without a continual walking in God's light. I don't think you'd have any assurance if that was true. We cannot earn salvation through good works, but our faith in Christ puts us in a special grace-filled relationship with God so that our obedience and love combined with our faith will be rewarded with eternal life. So the reward is eternal life by our obedience and our love. Next slide. The kingdom is not for people who want Jesus without any change in their living. It's only for those who seek it with all their hearts, those who agonize to enter. Many who approach the gate turn away upon finding out the cost. Lest someone object that this is salvation of human effort, remember it's only the enablement of divine grace that empowers a person to pass through the gate. While justification and sanctification are distinct theological concepts, both are essential elements of salvation. God will not declare a person righteous without also making him righteous. Well, that's Dr. McCarthy. That almost sounds like a Catholic idea of justification. It sounds like a works orientation. So this is what happens when you get confused on faith. You then end up with a confused idea of assurance or security. Next slide. We know the terminology. We talk about eternal security. And we talk about perseverance. And we talk about assurance. Dr. Robert Cook a um, conservative Baptist theologian many, many years ago kind of gives us the differentiation traditionally of eternal security. We're saved and can't lose it. Perseverance, we're going to be faithful through it. Assurance, the subjective confidence we have because of it. Well, not everybody would go this direction. <clears throat> Next slide. The Council of Trent kind of puts a person in doubt that if you have that kind of assurance, that you should be accursed from the Council of Trent. If you think you're really saved and you have no doubt, then you probably really need to have an anathema attached to you. But that's a Roman Catholic Church, so we aren't there. Next slide. The uh, Philadelphia Confession of Faith. Next slide, Erwin. <clears throat> Although temporary believers and other regenerate men may vainly deceive themselves with false hopes and carnal. Go back, Erwin. May vainly deceive themselves with false hopes and carnal presuppositions or presumptions of being in the favor of God and in a state of salvation, which hope of theirs shall perish, yet such as truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love him sincerely, endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before him, may in this life be certainly assured that they are in a state of grace and may rejoice in the hope and the glory of God, which hope shall never make them ashamed. So the unregenerate vainly deceive themselves with false hope, thinking they're in. They're not. 
they'll perish. But if you believe and love and endeavor to walk in all good conscience before him, then you can have assurance and persevere in the faith. Next slide. Next, go to next slide. I want to find another one just to save a little bit of time. Perseverance in the same states that all who are chosen by God, redeemed by Christ, redeemed by Christ and given faith by the Spirit are eternally saved. They're kept in faith by the power of the Almighty God and thus persevere to the end. So they're secure, but they will persevere to the end. Next slide. Dr. Sproul, the old axiom in Reformed theology about the perseverance of the saints is this, if you have it, that, that is, if you have genuine faith and are a state of saving grace, you will never lose it. And if you lose it, you never had it. So perseverance is tied to security. Next slide. And the next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Wayne Grudem, the perseverance of the saints, means that all those who are truly born again will, will be kept, will be kept by God's power and will persevere as Christians until the end of their lives, and that only those who persevere to the end have truly been born again. So you've got this idea of perseverance, and you have this idea of preservation. Is there a difference? Yes, there is. Next slide. The problem is some people don't want to see a difference between preservation and perseverance. Let's go to the next slide. And then the next slide. So the preservation of the saint is a teaching of the Holy Scriptures that all whom the Father elected eternally and all whom Jesus redeemed with his own blood and all whom the Holy Spirit irresistibly calls to salvation will be surely kept by God's power in faith and they shall be brought to eternal glory in heaven. So preservation means you will make it. The question is, will you always be faithful? Some would say you must be faithful. Others would not. Next slide. And last, next slide. Charlie Bing summarizes it this way. Preservation of believers, not perseverance of the saints, is the view taught by God's word and is consistent with the gospel of salvation by grace. So there's a difference. Preservation, God's side. Perseverance, man's side. I believe in preservation, absolutely. Once saved, always saved, eternal security. That doesn't mean I'll always be faithful. And so that means assurance is conditioned upon works in the Reformed tradition. And that becomes very problematic. This is not a new modern day event. Next slide. Many years ago, Dr. Michael Winship wrote his dissertation at Princeton University. And he wrote and became a book called Making Heretics. But I don't know if you can see the subtitle. He says in his subtitle, Militant Protestantism and Free Grace in Massachusetts, 1636-1641. This is a book tracing the free grace issue in pre-colonial Massachusetts. It was all about the heretics of the day. He says in Making Heretics, the free grace controversy, now get that, he's labeling it the free grace controversy, controversy for the structure, excuse me, for the stature of the persons involved and its long-term results was the greatest internal dispute of pre-Civil War Puritanism, either in England or New England. 
The controversy shook the infant Massachusetts Bay Colony from 36 to 38. Accusations of false doctrine flew back and forth. The government went into turmoil. And by the time the crisis had subsided, leading colonists had voluntarily departed or had been banished. It left a permanent stamp on New England. And in the terms of its impact in England, it was arguably the single most important event in 17th century American colonial history. Do you get that? Free grace and the doctrine of assurance was the most important theological issue in the pre-American colonial world and in England. Now, I talked with Dr. Winship. I read his book. I called him up. I got a hold of him at the University of Georgia where he teaches history. He doesn't even know what's going on in the modern free grace issue. He's tracking the historic free grace issue of assurance. And this became the most important topic within the church, both of England and New England. Next, next slide. He says, on no topic was the social and provisional nature of godly knowledge more evident than the one over which the free grace controversy was fought, assurance of salvation. It was a subject of eternal life and death importance. New paragraph, uh, excuse me, new uh, slide. Dr. David Halls, in his book, The Antinomian Controversy, he says, I argued in 1968 and would argue again that the, air, the assurance of salvation was the central issue in the controversy. So American, colonial America, early America, had brought over Calvinistic theology, which was being fought over in the Puritan church from, from the pilgrims to the Puritans. And the Puritans, we have the Great Awakening and all that. But the fight is over the doctrine of assurance. The fight is over the nature of saving faith and the role of assurance. This is not a modern thing in America or around the world. It's been going on. It's been going on since the Apostle Paul had to deal with people in Galatia. Next slide. Now, Dr. Schreiner says in, in his concept of final salvation, preserving in godly behavior, preserving, enduring, continual, preserving in godly behavior and sound teaching are necessary to obtain salvation. Believers must practice godly behavior to receive final salvation. Believers have to continue in good works to the very end in order to have final salvation. Next slide. So says Dr. Tom Schreiner in his book, The Race Set Before Us. Now, the doctrine of assurance goes from the theological world into the pastoral world. Next slide. Because theology always reaches down through the pulpit to the people. Dr. Washer puts it, or Pastor Washer puts it this way, one must submit to the Lordship of Christ to be born again. Assurance can be greater, and there's even a type of assurance called full. Assurance is by degrees. It depends on the degree that one walks as Christ walked. To the degree that these qualities are growing and observable realities, we may, we may assume that we possess eternal life. But what if we don't? Next pair, Next slide. Genuine believers can fall away many times, no matter how often he may fall, can have even periodic falls. And at any time in his life, a Christian may be running, walking, crawling, sliding, or even falling. But genuine believers do not fall away. Genuine believers continue their entire lives believing, repenting, and following, except when they don't in the many times. Next slide. The key to assurance is gradually growing in conformity to God, God's nature and will, so that there would be a discernible evidence, discernible to who? Discernible evidence of greater and greater conformity to the nature and will of God. Assurance depends on self-examination. No one can be genuinely born again who lives 
a life of open sin and rebellion. Next slide, Dr. Washer, or Mr. Washer summarizes it this way, using 1 John, gives us a dozen tests of whether we're born again. Like many Calvinists, Washer equates the judgment seat of Christ with the great white throne judgment. That becomes a problem, but that's what you have to do if you're an all-millennialist. Unregenerate people, quote, will perform good deeds and even reflect a resemblance of righteousness. However, over time, both the righteous and the wicked will be revealed by their ongoing behavior. So these are so subjective, and the, the lists are so inadequate. Kevin DeYoung puts it this way. Matthew 25 is about social justice in the sense that it's caring about caring for the needy. But the needy in view are fellow Christians, especially those dependent on our hospitality and generosity for their ministry. Jesus says, if we are too embarrassed, too lazy, or too cowardly to support our fellow Christians who depend on our assistance and are suffering for the sake of the gospel, we, we will go to hell. We should not make this passage say anything more or less than this. Now, apart from Matthew 25, not, you know, he's, he's a non-millennialist, so he doesn't understand Matthew 25. But we, fellow Christians, if we don't help our fellow Christians by giving them food, we will go to hell. You understand what that means? You understand the significance of that? Next slide. Ron Sider, who passed away this year. Jesus expressed it even more pointedly. To those who don't feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the prisoner, he will speak a terrifying word of the final judgment. Depart from me, you curse it in the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The meaning's clear. Jesus intends that his disciples imitate his own concern for the poor and needy. Those disciples who disobey, who don't feed the needy, will experience eternal damnation. Let that sink in. Next slide. Tim Keller talks about, again, out of Matthew, that if you lack sufficient works done for the poor, that proves you don't have true saving faith. You've got to have works sufficient. Next slide. Dr. Keller, who passed away a few months ago, has done many, many good things for the church, but this type of thinking was not one of them. He said the primary purpose of salvation is cultural renewal to make this world a better place. I don't think so. Next slide. And now next slide, we're going to skip a few. And then next slide. And then next slide. Next slide. Again, in Matthew 25, here is Joe Scarborough. Jesus actually is asked by his disciples, who's going to be able to sit at your right hand, go to be cast away? Jesus goes through the list and he talks about anyone that does not, for the least among us, do it to me. They will be with the sheep. Those who don't will be tossed out. They'll be with the goats. Next slide. So he says, it's one of the few times, Jesus says, this is what you have to do to get to heaven. And if you don't do it, you will not get to heaven. One of the times he says, this is it, giving a cup of water in the master's name, feed the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the prison, and again, helping the least among us. If you do not do that, you will not get to heaven. What does that tell you about the doctrine of assurance? If that's what you believe about the theology, the doctrine of assurance, and of course, you're going to have a theology of faith that has to be extremely voluntaristic and include all sorts of obedience or, Dr. Bates, allegiance. Next slide. 
So again, back to Dr. Schreiner, next slide. He would put it this way. God will award the verdict of righteousness to those whose conduct in the present world is governed by faith that fixes its vision on the unseen things of the age to come. God rewards faithfulness, so faithfulness is simultaneously the obedience that derives from faith. Now, wait a minute. Faithfulness derives from faith. So see the connection. It's an ongoing. And the proof that faith is genuine. So you have to have faith and faithfulness to prove that you have the right faith. Front load the gospel, back load the gospel. Next slide. Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, who was somewhat of a dispensationalist, somewhat of a reform guy, said, while freeing believers from the bondage of Rome, the Reformation brought them back in large measure under the bondage of Sinai. The church came out of the Middle Ages like Lazarus from the tomb, alive but bound in grave clothes. The Reformers took away one set of bindings but bound believers in another, the law. And this has atrophied the spiritual life of multitudes. The Reformation saved us from the Roman Catholic Church, but they didn't make a distinct break. They contained or continued, not with the papacy, but with the doctrines of Augustine, that temporary faith, the doctrines of Calvin, faith that's not genuine, it's, it's spurious. This unleashed a whole series of studies. Next slide. One of the more famous one is Calvin and English Calvinism to 1649. That's the Westminster Confession. Dr. Kendall, who started out as a charismatic Arminian, then went to Oxford to do his dissertation. And in utilizing the Calvinistic works, John Calvin, he said, should they begin to estimate it, assurance of their salvation, this is Calvin, by their good works, nothing will be weaker or more uncertain. Works, when estimated by themselves, no less proving the divine displeasure by their imperfection than his goodwill by their incipient purity. Good works are not needed. It's dangerous to use them. Next slide. Calvin goes on, and indeed, we do not deny that the faith which justifies us is accompanied by an earnest desire to live well and righteously, but we only maintain that our confidence cannot rest on anything else than on the mercy of God alone. So Kendall went through English Calvinism and showed what Calvin taught and how English Calvinism distorted it through Theodore Beza. So he went through the English line to show the degeneration of the doctrine of assurance in the English Calvinists. Next slide. Dr. Charles Bell did the same thing in his dissertation at Cambridge, except he did it through the Scottish line of theology. Now, remember, the English line and the Scottish line both come together in Westminster Confession and then end up in America. Dr. Bell says, as a general principle, Calvin emphatically warns against looking to ourselves, that is, to our works or the fruit of the Spirit, for the certainty of our salvation. We must turn from ourselves to rest solely on the mercy of God. Calvin actually said that. The scholastics taught that the Christians should look to works and to the virtues of righteousness as proof of salvation. However, Calvin rejects this exhortation to self-examination as a dangerous dogma and argues that we can never rely on such subjective basis for assurance, for our sinfulness ensures that we will not find peace in this way. Next slide. Forgetting the judgment of God, we may think ourselves safe when in fact we are not. By placing our trust in works rather than in God's freely given grace, we detract from his salvific work in Jesus Christ. If we look to ourselves, we encounter doubt, which leads to despair. And finally, our faith is battered down and blotted out. Assurance that our assurance, excuse me, arguing that our assurance rests in our union with Christ, Calvin stressed that contemplation of Christ brings assurance of salvation. But self-contemplation is sure damnation. For this reason, then, our safest course is to look to Christ 
and distrust ourselves. So Calvin taught assurance by faith. Calvinism, through the English line and the Scottish line, taught assurance by works. Now, Calvin double-talked every once in a while, but he clearly had in mind the danger of making assurance predicated solely upon good works. Next slide. So again, as Marshall said, Arminians know they're saved, but afraid they can't keep it. Calvinists know they can't lose it, but they don't know if they even got it. So there came a whole lot of books reflecting this thinking. Next slide. Assurance of Salvation by Dr. Ro uh, Robert Peterson, classic reformed. Next slide. Joel Beakey, The Quest for Full Assurance, very, very uh, strong, strident view of hyper-Calvinism. Next slide. Another edition of Beakey's book, another addition, not addition, but addition to his Doctrine of Assurance. Next slide, the assurance of faith uh, written by Zachman to, to look at Calvin's view. Next slide, the famous Arminian I. Howard Marshall, kept by the power of God. This is a classic study. If you don't have it, get it. He goes through every verse and shows how it works. But here's the danger. Next slide, as Dr. Jody Dillow has put it, a necessary result for which we are responsible and which must be present for another result to occur is no different from an additional condition and cause for the achievement of that second result. Now hear that again. A necessary result, obedience, for which we are responsible, obeying, and which must be present for another result to occur, salvation, is no different from an additional condition and cause for the achievement of that second result. Next slide. So if works are necessary, are the necessary results of salvation, then they are an additional condition to gain salvation. Salvation by faith alone, but faith that saves is never alone, becomes saved by faith and necessary works. Because if there are no works, there's no salvation. Therefore, works and faith must be present for salvation to be genuine. Works are a condition for final salvation. Now think what this does to your doctrine of assurance. That then means you have to have a certain different view of what faith is. So go forward. Faith definition leads to assurance. Definition leads to pastoral ministry. They go together. However, we would say there's an objective basis for assurance. It goes back to the Gospel of John, believing in his name, look and live, believe in him. If you've done that, you pass from death to life and will never come into judgment. Or as John 20 puts it, believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and then believing you may have life in his name. Next slide. Will the Christian always be faithful? I don't think so. Look at the verses. You all know them. There's plenty of evidence of people who don't always be faithful. And some die because of their disobedience. And that's why Paul said, I beat my body black and blue. That's why he didn't, understand, he didn't know about the recompense. He wanted to stand before the Bema and be rewarded. These were conditional upon abiding and obeying so that when he got to the Bema seat. Next, pair, next slide. Can I have assurance of eternal life? Yes. John said so. Next slide. Can we have assurance that we're eternally secure and that God will preserve us to the end and get us home? You bet. That is the purpose of the Father. That's the power of the Father. That's the person of the Son, the promise of the Son, the prayer by the Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Eternal security, absolute. But will we always be faithful? Not really. Next slide. We have to understand that faith is defectible. Eternal security is not. But our faithfulness can become defectible. Beautiful case study. Next slide. Simply ask the question about a certain man. Was Demas saved? Next slide. We only have three passages about Demas. 
in Colossians, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Philemon, there's, uh, there, salute the three, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, Jesus, Marcus, uh, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. Who's Demas? He's a fellow laborer. He worked with Paul. And then at the end, Timothy, as Paul writes to Timothy, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and de has departed un in, unto Thessalonica. Demas for, has forsaken because he loved the world. Well, 1 John 2.15 says, don't love the world or the things of the world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Christians can fall in love with the world, just like Demas. Reformed theology says Demas went to hell. I think he went to heaven. Now, I know we're coming to the end. Let me look, let me look at one passage. Next slide. We'll be done in two minutes. If you have your Bible, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. In that passage, Paul, in that book, Paul is talking to Timothy about ministry. But as you turn to chapter 2, verse 11, next slide, we see eternal security and eternal significance put together. Let me read it to us. It's a trustworthy statement, verse 11. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he'll also deny us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Next slide. You'll notice that Paul writes this in a chiastic structure. If we die, we live. That's A. Look at the very bottom, A prime. If we're faithless, he remains faithful. These two are talking about eternal security. If we endure, we'll also reign with him. If we deny him, he'll deny us. This is talking about eternal significance. Next slide. Paul is talking to Timothy about a faithful saying, and he teaches him two doctrines, eternal security, eternal significance. One is about going to heaven and making it. The other is about living on the earth faithfully to Christ. Next slide. So we have this chiastic structure put together. Paul has talked about these before. Next slide. If you look at the whole book, you'll see both topics are covered. But one last thing to focus on. Next slide. And people often miss this. If we've died with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we'll reign. If we deny him, he'll deny us. Look at the last phrase. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. But notice the word in red. If we are faithless, that's not an adjective. Like the next word in green is an adjective. The first word, faithless, is a verb. It's a present active indicative verb. It, and it's got the negative alpha attached to the word pistis. If we don't believe, he remains faithful faithful, because he cannot deny himself. It is possible for a Christian to stop believing, but God never stops being faithful. Eternal security? Absolutely. Eternal significance? That could change. Next slide. So I think this is a helpful passage to bring together the idea of both faith and then the concept of assurance. Enrique, I think I should stop there because I'm supposed to stop there. I have many more things to say, but maybe for another day. Thank you, Dr. Shea. That was, uh, uh, as I've always told, listening to you in your class, in your lectures, is like drinking from a fire hose. There's so much to unpack from your lecture. Um, there's a question that I got, Dr. Shea. Uh, we will now transition to uh, the question and answer portion. And for those of you who wants, uh, I already have some questions here at the Q&A uh, window, but um, Dr. Shea will dive into the Q&A immediately. Um, usually the concern when there's a presentation regarding free grace is that it is equated with either easy believism or hyper grace. 
Someone defined easy believism as reducing salvation to a simple mental ascent without genuine life change. And in the same post, uh, they defined hyper grace as using grace as an excuse to live without any moral boundaries. How would you respond to this, Dr. Shea, these accusations? Well, <clears throat> hyper grace is uh, by way of the question, and it sounds like they are equating hyper grace with antinomianism. Now, anti against no loss law, antinomianism is against the law. Well, the fact is, I'm against the law. I'm not saved by the Mosaic law. I don't keep the Mosaic law, and I like bacon with my eggs in the morning. So I'm not under Mosaic law. So, in the terms of a hyper grace, that's kind of a misnomer. Um, we don't believe in living licentiously, but living licentiously is not a condition or a non condition for becoming a Christian. Easy believism is, again, a misnomer. Number one, it's not easy to believe. You have to believe that you're a sinner. You have to believe there's a God. You have to believe there's hell. you got to believe that he's the only way to get you to heaven. That's not easy to believe because I don't see him. There's no empirical evidence. There's no touch in the handle or whatever. That's not easy. Now, what they mean is all you have to do is believe in Jesus to be saved. Well, wait a minute. Let me ask your questioner. Don't you believe that all you have to do is believe in Jesus to be saved? And they would probably say yes. And then they would say, oh, but but you need to live right. And I would say, is that a condition to becoming a Christian? How can I live right before I'm a Christian? When I become a Christian is when I become a Christian. After I become a Christian is when I, is when I can do something about that but I can't do something about it before I'm saved. You want me to walk before I'm born. You got to be born again before you can walk. So they're conflating the result with the condition or the cause. The condition is faith. The result would be walking. The One is justification by faith alone. The other is peripatology, the Christian life, Christian walking, or we call that sanctification. So I don't, I think what they've done is they, they want to, provide their definitions, and I don't accept their definitions. Let's go back to the gospel. Believe in Christ, period. That's all. It doesn't say believe, surrender, and, and commit, and promise to be good, and have total allegiance to the cosmic Lord. It doesn't say that at all. It just Jesus said, if you believe in me, you have eternal life, period. Easy? Not really. Thank you, Dr. Shea. Um, actually, this is a post on Facebook. They say that they labeled it as false teachings that Christians should stay away from. They mentioned easy believism. They mentioned hyper grace. It also mentioned focusing exclusively on grace. And they say that it is false because it is ignoring the call for personal holiness and righteous living. How do we respond to this, Dr. Shea? Well, number one, I, I'm very glad that Dr. Grudem has never called me a false teacher, and he's never called me a heretic. He may not agree with everything. He thinks free grace is a weakened form of the gospel. But I said, Wayne, will it save a person? He said, yes. Then it doesn't sound like a weakened form of the gospel to me. So your the questioner <clears throat> needs to understand something very clearly. I think I can speak for the free grace community. I've been involved with it for a long time. I've, I've, I've been involved with the, the groups that it's founded. I would say this, people who believe in free grace theology have an extremely high, well-developed doctrine of sanctification, progressive sanctification. We believe in the doctrine of rewards extremely, the only difference is we don't think that is connected to the doctrine of salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. You don't have to be obedient and to gain reward in terms of becoming a Christian. The reward is not becoming a Christian. The reward is eternal life. Now, once I have eternal life, I'm to live obediently. Anybody who knows anything about the teaching of free grace theology knows that we are adamant about holiness, godliness, 
progressive sanctification. In fact, we teach it more than the Reformed people because they don't have a very strong view of the doctrine of reward. So once again, the question sounds to me to be misinformed about what we teach. Grace is, without grace, you don't even start the game. But once grace starts the game and you gain eternal life by faith alone, then it's time to grow and mature and walk. So we dif differentiate between the two, but obedience, holiness, absolute and free grace theology. That question reflects a lack of reading in free grace literature. Thank you, Dr. Shea. Michael has a question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shea. Those are uh, such a wealthy and rich uh, research on, exege and, on exegetical and theological and biblical uh, data that you gave us. And I, I think it's a full-blown three-unit class in a uh, seminary. <laughs> but again, thank you. So what I got from uh, your talk, Dr. Shea, um, we are, in a sense, pushing back against lordship salvation. We're pushing back against reformed and Calvinisted notions of salvation. And uh, I uh, and their their attempt to say that we are saved by faith alone, but faith is never alone. By by saying that, they are saying that there is much to believing Christ and trusting His finished work on the cross. And they would seem to imply that you need to surrender your life. You need to uh, prove it by producing holiness and good works and all of that. So I guess my, my question is uh, this debate on uh, uh, Lordship salvation actually boils down to the idea of is there a, a difference between conversion and discipleship? So I, th I guess the argument comes from many from our brothers from the Reformed and Calvinist camp that a Christian is a disciple and a disciple is a Christian. It's, it's like justification and sanctification is all in the same. So conversion is not just that easy of trusting Christ as Savior. You have to give your life to Him in allegiance and surrender and obedience through Lordship. Is that an accurate uh view of what we are trying to push back against where it's like they're mixing law and grace and there are they are they actually trying to mix uh sanctification and justification conversion and discipleship into one what are your thoughts on on those ideas well first let me say that the reformed people i know are godly good predominantly men, those are the ones I know, they are godly, good men, well-educated, who want the church to be purified and God to be glorified. So their motives are good. I'm going to assume their motives are good. The manner in which they achieve that, I don't agree with. The manner they assume will purify the church is the law and the the challenging people to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Dr. MacArthur told me that to my face. He said, this is what we need to do. We need to challenge people being Christians because that'll make them look at their life. And if they have enough works, that'll give them evidence that they're saved. So it's good for people to doubt their salvation in his words. I don't agree with that, but I understand his thinking. So yes, we are pushing back against a theology that says, you're saved by faith, but there must be works. Not that you're saved by the works, but the works are the evidence that you're saved. And if you don't, you're going to have a whole bunch of people in church who aren't saved. I mean, I, I know a, a Reformed pastor of a mega church who said, I know many people in this church are not saved. One elder went and said he, he thought a third of the people in his church were not saved. So they want to drive them to the gospel by challenging whether they're saved or not. You, they have done exactly what you've said. They have combined the doctrine of justification and sanctification together. Here's a real simple test. You ask the question, 
John 3.16. We all know what that says, and we believe what it says. Great. Next question. Is John 3.16 the same message as Luke 14, verses 25 to 35? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brother and sisters, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross, come after me, cannot be my disciple. No one who can be my disciple does not give up all his own possessions. Now, Jesus says three things. My question is, is Luke 14 the same as John 3.16? In my mind, those messages are totally distinct. One is about a free gift. One is about a prize. One is free. One is costly. Two different messages, but I believe some of the Reformed people have blended them together to form one message. We think they're distinct. They're different. You're saved by faith and grace. You're developed and maturing by a faithfulness that works. Mm -hmm. So the problem is they combined the message. The Roman Catholic Church did this, and they overlapped them on top of each other. The reform bring them together and they touch, and sometimes they overlap a little bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Doctor Shea. Uh, before I uh, allow others to ask, la last two questions, maybe Pastor Eric, okay, lang ba? Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, yes yeah, last two questions from me at least, and then the others can also ask, Doctor Shea. My other question, maybe in connection with the first one, was the the definition of repentance, metanoia. So repentance or metanoia is defined as the changing of the mind. But many Protestants, particularly from the Reformed camp and the Calvinist camp, defined it not just as, ch as changing of the mind, but also of the surrendering of the life, the, the, trans the, the turning away from sins and the changing of the life as a prerequisite to salvation, repentance. So I think that's uh, my first layer of question. The other question is, I think it's also the elephant in the room. One of the uh, source of debate between Calvinist evangelicals and non-Calvinist evangelicals is the idea of pistio, pist faith. Faith is faith a gift to by God to people or to the elect, or is faith? Or, or is salvation the gift and faith is the means of receiving the gift? So what, what are your thoughts on that for the sake of the others who are still maybe wrestling with the issue? Thank you. Well, first of all, the doctrine of repentance is a very thorny issue. Uh, David Allen, who uh, has had taught at Southwestern Baptist uh, Theological Seminary, who's a great theologian and preacher, um, and a friend of mine, I asked him once, I said, David, what do you Baptists mean by the word repentance? And he started laughing. He said, well, it depends on what Baptist you talk to. We mean all kinds of things. So it's a little bit difficult to get unanimity about that. Here's what I think, though. Within the free grace camp, um, some people believe that repentance means a change of mind, right? Metanoia, a changing of the mind. Dr. Charlie Bing would hold to that view. Dr. Ryrie would hold to that view. Others would say repentance is included with the idea of remorse, feeling sad, emotional, and a willingness to turn and change from sin. That has more of a volitional view. Obviously, Dr. Grudem and Dr. MacArthur would say repentance is essential, and it includes turning from sin. Even within the free grace camp, there are those who believe repentance might mean at least a changing of the mind and a willingness to turn from sin. Now, it's interesting in the Gospel of John, you never find the word repent. And it's interesting in many, many of the um, gospel offerings, you only find the word believe. So, it's interesting that the word repent is not used by Paul very much, and it's never used by John in the gospel. So maybe it, it, it's assumed under the word pistis or faith. So repentance is one of those terms that depends on where you want to come from. Myself, I think the changing of the mind seems to make sense. Uh, 
because turning epistrepho, that's a different term for turning around. If he wanted turning around, he would use turn around, but he doesn't. He uses repent. You need to change your mind. Now, look at it this way. You can't become a Christian unless you change your mind about two things. One, I'm not a good guy. I'm a sinner. I need to change my mind about that. I'm not a good guy. I'm a sinner. Second, I need to change my mind about Jesus. He's not a dead Jew. He's the risen Savior. Well, if you don't change your mind about who you think you are and who you think he is, you can't be saved. But when you believe, you've changed your mind. So I think they can actually function together. That's how I would wrestle with that. Now, there's a lot more about repentance, but we probably don't have time for that. But back to your other question about faith in, in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So what is the it? Now, some people say it is the faith, and therefore faith is the gift. Well, grammatically, that doesn't work. So then people say, well, it is the whole salvation is a gift. So you either say, well, the faith itself is the gift, but grammatically that's not proper because of the, the, the uh, gendering. So others would say the whole salvation issue is a gift of God. So uh, Dr. Greg Sapa, one of our former professors, wrote an excellent article on that. And many people have written on this in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. But again, in the Reformed tradition, you have to have the string go this way. God elects, then he preordains, then he regenerates you, and then he gives you the gift of faith. All of these are supernatural acts of God, and therefore there will be a supernatural act in your life and change of obedience. Now, the problem is this. Why do I sin at all? If I'm elect and preordained and regenerated and given the gift of faith, why do I sin? If, if I can only sin a little bit, why can I sin at all? They don't answer that question. If they say, well, it's because of your sin nature, then I say, that's exactly right. It's because of my sin nature, and I sin. You say I can only sin a little bit. I say I can sin more. Why can I sin at all? It's because of the sin nature. So they have a problem explaining this. They have a subjective sliding scale. Very dangerous. Thank you, Dr. Shea. There's another question here. Um, as Dr. Shea's last statement or quote, a believer could stop believing but still be saved. Isn't that you need to believe to be saved? Need further understand the explanation, please. Thanks. From Oscar Olquillo. So if I understand that right, I think I would say this. I need, as a non-Christian, I need to receive the gift of eternal life. You receive the gift by believing. That's John 1.12. So when I receive the gift, I believe in his name. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I've started the race. Now I need to keep on believing. This is where I need to grow in my faith. I need to become strong in faith, not weak in faith. But it is possible for my faith to become shipwrecked, to become weak. So one act of faith appropriates the gift of eternal life. A life of faithfulness is the discipleship way. So we do distinguish between becoming a believer and living as a believer. Two different things, justification, sanctification. The prize, the gift, excuse me, the, the prize, and then the gift, and then the prize. We got to keep those two separate. So yeah, we do hold there's a distinction between justification and sanctification. But faith is involved with both of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Shea, there's another question from Joe Ibanez. Um, How can a sinner be justified, saved by faith in Jesus Christ or by the faith of Jesus Christ? 
Well, this is the argument about the subjective objective genitive. Are we saved, you know, is it the faith of Christ or faith in Christ? Um, and New Testament scholars have argued over this for the last 20 years. Uh, some say we're saved by the faithfulness of Jesus. Well, on the one hand, that's true, right? Jesus was faithful to go to the cross to die for our sin. And because of his faithfulness, he fulfilled Isaiah 53. He fulfilled John 129. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He became the justifier of the many. He became the mercy seat because he was faithful. We can believe in him, but we have to believe in him. So it is his faithfulness that saves us, but it's also our faith in him that saves us. Both and. Uh, Dr. Say, there's another question. Have you read Wayne uh, Gruden's position with regards to free grace theology in the second edition of his systemat systematic theology? Uh, Can you tap on this? Yeah, Dr. Grudem very kindly sent me a copy of his latest edition. <laughs> of I now have three very large volumes of Wayne Grudem's book that he's given me very kindly. So yeah, I, I got a bunch of his book. <laughs> he's very kindly. He gives, he gives me all of his stuff. It's great. And his book on ethics is the best book out there on the market. So if you need a book on ethics, go buy it. It's fabulous. So yes, he sent me that book. And in that book, if you'll notice, he has two errors. He misquotes me twice. He attributes some book to me that I didn't write, and he attributes my book to somebody else who didn't write it. So somebody made a mess on the footnotes. But that's okay. We all make mistakes in publishing. Um, Dr. Grudem, I do not believe, fully understood what we believe, and he did not accurately represent it in that third edition. In the third edition, he does do more and say more because he's responding to some of us, but I don't think he clearly got the issue. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shea. Um, somebody asked, anonymous, one anonymous question from a participant. He said, it was said in Galatians 5.24 that those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desire. Does it not mean our works must be changed if we belong to Jesus? How do we apply this verse from a free grace point of view? Positionally, I am crucified with Christ, Romans 6. Practically, I need to crucify my flesh every day. Paul in Romans 13 said, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Well, positionally, I've been crucified in Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who dwelleth in me. But practically, I need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. So again, it's the difference between our position and our practice. Ephesians 1 to 4 one to three, our position, Ephesians four to six, our practice. Romans, our position, Romans, our practice. So I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. But on the other hand, I need to live out, walk in the power of the Spirit, crucifying the flesh. So I need to become in practice what I am in my position. Okay, Dr. Shea, uh, Brother Paul has a question. Brother Paul, can you unmute your mic? Yeah, hi, Dr. Shea. Good morning, Paul, or good evening. I, I came to your talk because I thought you were going to talk about your book, uh, The Faith That Saves. And I'm, I'm excited you said that the, there's a new edition that's coming out. I hope it comes out in Kindle or one of the electronic platforms as well. So we here in the Philippines can get a hold of it uh, more quickly. But my question is about something you said in the book, and I thought it was it would be um, useful for um, I thought it was useful for us that are active at the forum of Grace for All. Uh, you, you said that theologians of all levels of training and skill, new believers and lay leaders, to pastors and professors are frequently blinded by pre-understanding or bias. You even talked about um, concept called. Uh, the hermeneutical, hermeneutical 
spiral. I don't know if you want to talk about that, but would, would you tell us, you know, why is it important to be precise about our interpretation of the scriptures? Yeah, we need to become both precise and accurate at the same time, right? We need precision and accuracy. Everybody, everybody has a pre-understanding. Everybody has a bias. Everybody has something working in their back drive that impacts the way they come to the Bible. Everybody. Free grace people do, reform people do, Arminians, Calvinists, Roman Catholics, Orthodox, everybody's got something historically stored up. Now, that's why exegesis, the procedure, and hermeneutics, the principles, have to be engaged in. I think the free grace movement has done a wonderful job of starting out to be exegetes before theologians. This is due to the, the groundbreaking work by Dr. or Professor Zane Hodges uh, many, many years ago at Dallas Seminary. He was an exegete. He was an exegete par excellence. And so he spent his time doing the exegetical work using a proper procedure and a proper hermeneutical principle to do the spade work. Once you do the exegetical work, you then build up your theology. The free grace movement has done good exegetical work. We are beginning to do biblical theology work, but we have not yet done systematic theology work. We're working on that. There are people working on that. Dr. Ed DeZago in Phoenix, Arizona, is working on a four-volume systematic theology book from a total free grace perspective, but it's not done yet. So we must start with exegesis, build it to biblical theology, then systematics. The free grace movement or the modern free grace movement was founded upon this. Even back in the 1850s, 1900s, people like Robert Govett, who was a fellow at Oxford University, he was an exegete a hundred years ahead of his time. G.H. Lang, an exegete in the 1940s, 1950s. Many, many exegetes have done the groundwork. Now we're building our biblical theology. Reformed theology has not been known for their exegetical basis. In the past, a lot of it has been built upon just a theological substratum from Augustine and then Calvin to the modern movement. And Calvin admitted everything he knows comes from Augustine. So basically, the Reform movement is Augustinian theology, which has now become very suspect by Dr. Ken Wilson, who did his PhD Oxford dissertation on Calvinism and Augustinian theology. So we're, we in the free grace movement are exegetical and we're doing our homework to get to biblical theology while we evaluate the Reformed people who are very highly influenced by their historical theology. Dr. Grudem has a PhD in New Testament, but he teaches theology. So his New Testament theological stuff that he did years ago at Cambridge is the basis but he is, he is um, focused more on his theological work than his exegetical work, in my view. So all of us have a pre-understanding. All of us have a bias. We have to try to put it aside and be exegetes of the New Testament. That, if, if Eric would allow me a, a follow-up question, just a quick one. Um, but but all, all of us, all, the, the problem I think we have is that we're all we have are... Uh, writings or books from from the U.S. That, that are more reformed than anything else, and so if you were to, which I don't like, uh, the guys here know that I don't like debates. I like to be able to persuade people. And if you were to persuade me or, or teach me or advise me on what to do so that I can do the work of hermeneutics, do the work of doing proper in, in interpretation for a, for a layperson like myself, how, how would you how would you advise me to go through that? So there are... and, and Dr. Shea, in addition to that, there's a question that is related to what Paul said 
about what's the content of faith. I think that's related to his question also. So if if I understand Paul right, he's saying, what, what do I need to do to study up on this? So there's two ways. One is the direct way. The other is the secondary way or the indirect way. The indirect way is to read exegetical works on this topic. And so you would read a defense of free grace theology. You would read Final Destiny. You would read Living for the Kingdom. You would read Free Grace Soteriology by Dr. Dave Anderson. You would read secondary books that write about it. Some write at exegesis level, some write at theology level. The direct way would be you go to seminary, you learn Greek, you learn exegesis, and you start from the bottom up. That's the direct way. Now, if you have the time and the money and the ability, that's the best way. If you don't have the time or the opportunity, then you read the best books that deal with it exegetically. That's what I would suggest. And the good news is there's more and more good resources out there. Now, Eric, your question was, what's the content of faith? Or what's the content of the gospel? Or we're sharing the gospel. What should we say to the person? So this is an argument um, between the Reformed and the free grace, but also inside the free grace, there's argument going on. So in the Reformed group, you have to believe that Jesus, uh, you, you know, the Reformed doctrine would teach that you need to believe that you're a sinner, you're going to hell, Jesus died for your sin and rose from the dead and is your propitiatory sacrifice for your sin bearer. And you need to believe and commit your life to that. Or you need to believe by surrendering your life to him, confessing your sin and promising to be obedient. Those kinds of additional terms get woven in from the reform side. If you're Matthew Bates, Allegiance, allegiance, total surrender. Okay. From the free grace side, you have two camps. One camp, the normal view, is you need to believe that you're a sinner. Jesus died and rose again. And when you believe in him, you can have eternal life. Period. You believe in the person and the promise. Period. That's, I would say, the major view within the free grace camp. There is a second view inside the free grace camp. This is often called the crossless gospel. This is a view that says you don't need to know who Jesus is, meaning God. You don't need to know you're a sinner. You don't need to know you're going to hell. You don't need to know that Jesus rose from the dead. All you have to believe is Jesus guarantees me eternal life, believing him for it. Now, notice the content of that does not include who Jesus is. It doesn't mm -hmm. include I'm a sinner. It doesn't include the cross or the resurrection. It only says I believe Jesus guarantees me eternal security. I believe I'm eternally secure by believing in Jesus. So the, the promise is eternal security by believing in Jesus. But you don't know who Jesus is. You assume he's God, but you don't have to know that. You don't have to know about the cross and resurrection or your own sin. Now, that is a view that's held by some, the minority. They have a reason for believing that. Mm -hmm. I don't hold to that view. Grace School Theology doesn't hold to that view. The Free Grace Alliance doesn't hold to that view. Most of the Free Grace people don't hold to that view. So there's a, there's a, a breach in, that, in the Free Grace movement of those two views. Thank you, Dr. Shea. Uh, last question. I'm sorry we're, we've gone over time, but let me ask this question. He said, from an anonymous participant, he said, correct me if I'm wrong. Are you saying 
that the Roman Catholics and the reformed reformers got it all wrong for all those years and are therefore not saved? That it just recently that the ancient apostolic faith was rediscovered? Well, now that's a great question. Um, there are some in the free grace movement who believe all Catholics are going to hell and many Reformed people are going to hell because they don't believe the true gospel. Uh, I don't hold that view. I do believe Wayne Grudem. I do believe John MacArthur. They are going to heaven because they do believe you're saved by faith alone. They're confused with the role of works at the back end, but they do believe you're saved by faith alone or by grace alone through faith alone. So I would not say they're all going to hell. Uh, I would say they have a confused gospel sometimes. I've heard Dr. Grudem and Dr. MacArthur give a very clear free grace gospel invitation. And I've heard them both give a very unclear gospel invitation. Uh, I'd like to do a summary maybe. I I guess uh, Dr. Shea can also confirm if this is if I got it right. Uh, I, I'm speaking maybe in behalf of those who are still probably trying to pin down what we talked about tonight. And uh, by the way, we have a lot of Armenian and Wesleyan brothers tonight. So I guess in the conversation we mentioned free grace evangelicals and reformed Calvinist evangelicals. But Dr. Shea, is this an accurate summary of? of uh, your thoughts. What do you think about this? Are the Armenian view, those who trust Jesus are saved by faith alone, but the believer needs to maintain salvation through faithfulness or good works. For the Calvinist, those who are elect will be given faith to trust Jesus, but they need to prove that they are elect through faithfulness and good works. For the free grace, those who trust Jesus are saved by faith alone. And yet, while faithfulness and good works are inevitable results of salvation, faithfulness and good works are not required for salvation. Is that a more or less accurate summary of the ideas that are within the evangelical family? I think that's a very, very good summary. I do believe that in the free grace view, we are saved by faith alone, not by works. But I do believe every person who becomes a Christian, they will do something. They are changed. They're going from hell to heaven. That's a change. They're, they're regenerated and born again. That's a change. And there will be something that happens inside and usually outside. We are not saying that a person can become a Christian and then from the next moment on, live like hell, never do anything good. And we're not saying that. Nobody says that. What we're arguing against is making works necessary for salvation or the barometer of whether you're in or out. That's the danger. But Mike, the way you summarize, that's very, very helpful. And for, for our Arminian friends, many of the Reformed people feel that free grace is simply an extension of Arminianism. Dr. Dan Wallace thinks we're Arminianism, Arminianism in our views. Um, although we do hold to it, we don't hold the prevenient grace, the traditional Arminian way, the, our view of regeneration does seem to fit with Arminianism because we do believe that faith precedes regeneration. Yes. So we're clearly not on the reform side, which sounds much more like an Arminian. Mm. Oh, wow. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shea. And uh, this is, has been a wonderful uh, time of learning together. And uh, that, uh, that's very rich lecture coming from your exegetical work, your biblical work, and your decades of uh, studying theology and the Bible. So it is uh, like sitting down and uh, feasting on a buffet of wisdom and uh, theological insights. Thank you again, Dr. Fred Shea. I hope we can invite you again on future events and uh, future fora. So thank you, Ren, uh, Pastor Eric, for helping us uh, host tonight's uh, conversation. Uh, on behalf of Grace for All Coalition, we would like to thank everyone who participated. Also, thank you for Free Grace Alliance.
for uh, partnering with us and Grace School of Theology and Grace Asia and our uh, pastors and friends from the Free Grace Movement as well. Thank you, Brother Paul Gonzalez. Thank you, thank you Pastor James Paet, Pastor Erwin Amador uh, for uh, helping organize this uh, uh, wonderful theological conversation. Thank you also for your support and your participation with the Grace for All Coalition. So